Good evening. I am Ella McChrystal. I'm a psychotherapist, clinical hypnotherapist, mindset coach, and recently certified in EMDR, which is a wonderful psychotherapy for trauma and PTSD. I work broadly within the mental health field, but I also work with international athletes, people from the world of film and arts, and also corporate leaders. About 10 years ago, because of my interest in the brain and how it links to the body, I bought the multidisciplinary health clinic, the Northampton Clinic, where we as a team work with the mind, body, and soul. We work holistically, and it's a beautiful place to come to if you're from Northampton. So I entered the world of psychotherapy after my own experience of intrafamilial childhood sexual abuse. My subsequent quest to heal and to learn about myself led me into this field because I wanted to use my pain for power and help others. My fascination with the brain led me to understand how certain therapeutic tools, particularly clinical hypnotherapy, could help reframe and be life-changing for those people that had gone through any trauma, but also any mind block or difficulty. But tonight, I'm going to talk about phobias and fears. Now, my interest in this area peaked after I developed a phobia myself. And it happened much later in life. And I think most of us think people have phobias forever. But actually, mine came on during pregnancy. For the first couple of weeks, I started to notice that I was bleaching all the areas of my house on a daily basis. But weirdly, I was also picking up litter outside my house. And at the time, I didn't know there was anything wrong with me. In fact, I wondered why everybody else wasn't doing the same. It was only when my daughter was born that I realized I had an overwhelming fear of germs. Now, I, it took me a while to work it out, but I realized that that was actually a fear of her suffering. And it was because I hadn't been protected and because I had suffered that I became hypervigilant and overprotective of her. And it did take me about a year to realize that I had to start working through it because when you're in that zone, when you're in the phobia, you feel like you're right and everybody else is wrong. So with some introspection and reflection, I realized that I had to work out where it had started and apply the tools that I'm going to talk about tonight. So let's look at phobias first. So what is a phobia? Now, some of you might have experienced phobias or at least severe anxiety, trauma, fear reactions. But phobias are diagnosable mental disorders. And essentially, people that have phobias can have quite a limited life experience because they have severe panic attacks. They will avoid situations and they can develop secondary phobias. So how do we get them? As mentioned, after my own experience of trauma, I developed a phobia. But for some people, it's after a horrible event at the doctor's for injections. If you're five years old and it's stressful, you will keep that memory stored in your brain and you will always view, not always, but some people will always view that as a scary experience. We can learn our phobias too. So if you have a parent who's horrified every time they see a spider, you're likely to respond that way after seeing it repeatedly. And the brain literally tracks that memory and each time you're exposed to that phobia yourself or the phobia stimuli, your brain will give you the perceived appropriate response. So then we look at prepared fears. Now, prepared fears are those things that were useful to our ancestors. So, for example, it was very useful for our ancestors to be scared of snakes and spiders because they were poisonous. If they weren't scared, they might have died. And so these prepared fears have become deeply ingrained in our psyche as our brain has evolved. And we now have that sort of innate fear of even heights, but anything really that was perceived as dangerous to primitive man. And then there are complex phobias. Now, these are like social phobias. So, <laughs> like now, imagine if something went horrifically wrong. I would recall that and remember that and possibly never want to do a public speaking event again. So, the brain, again, will release all those chemicals and hormones. And the brain perceives it as a very scary thing. So what can we do about our phobias? Well, as I mentioned, we can use hypnotherapy. Hypnotherapy assists a process called neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity is how the brain can rewire, reshape, and function differently to how it did before. So let's talk about how that works. With hypnotherapy, we relax the client. We use a specific protocol to relax the client. 
the client becomes deeply relaxed, brainwave activity slows down, and the brain is now less hypervigilant. We've bypassed the analytical layer and we're entering the subconscious mind. Now, the subconscious mind is approximately 95% of what we think. So think about driving. At one point, you were learning to drive and it was really difficult to remember everything, and then soon it becomes automatic. When we enter the subconscious, we can make powerful changes. What do we experience, though, when we're having a phobia? Well, we have the phobia stimuli in front of us, and our brain starts to send messages. So the amygdala, which is the fear response, it tracks perceived danger, will be hypervigilant. Hormones in the brain are released. That triggers the adrenal glands to release adrenaline and noradrenaline, which activates the sympathetic nervous system. We are now in fight flight. And that can show lots of different symptoms. And again, if you've had anxiety or any sort of fear response before, you'll recognize some of these. So we become sweaty. That makes us slippery to the predator so we can get away quickly. Heart rate increases, respiration increases. You might feel your heart thumping. I mean, I wouldn't know what that feels like, but heart thumping, tight chest, trembly hands. Now, that's because your muscles are primed for action. The oxygen's rushing around your body, making you ready for fight flight. You might feel tingling. That's the blood rushing to the surface. Digestive enzymes slow down rapidly. They're not needed during fight flight. Slow down, you might be sick, but you might need to empty your bowels. Not particularly nice, but still that happens to a lot of people. You'll also notice that you might feel hyper-focused and pupils dilate to let more light in so that we've got a better vision of our surroundings. They're just some of the symptoms that you might have experienced yourself. And of course, there are a lot more. Going back to neuroplasticity and hypnotherapy then. Once we've got somebody into that relaxed state, and it does feel a bit like a dozy stage. You know, like when you're watching a film and you start to fall asleep and you're no longer paying attention to what's in the background, but you can still hear it. It feels a bit like that. At this stage, we're ready to go to the subconscious mind. Repetition is recognition. So when we do these hypnotherapy sessions, I always record them for people so that they can repeat again and again and again. Neurons that fire together wire together. So the more we hear the same information, those neurons recognize each other and they fuse through a synapse, wire together, and we create new circuits, new sequences in the brain. We change the way our brain sees particular events. And it's important to state here that we use our imagination actually quite negatively most of the time. Our imagination tells us what the worst case scenario will be. So we can change that. We can look at the best case scenario. We can reframe the way we see absolutely anything. So these techniques don't just work for phobias, they work for any situation where you've needed to think differently. So let's look at that a bit more. There's three techniques that I broadly use with phobias and I blend them together for each person. And before I tell you about them, it's really important to mention another thing, which is confirmation bias. For those of you that don't know what confirmation bias is, it's how we view the world through our lens. It's based on our experiences and our belief systems. And actually, I think most of you may have experienced this yourself. You know when you recall a memory and you think you're right? Well, sometimes we're not. Sometimes it's perception plus fact. And actually, each time we recall a memory, we recall it from the last time we remembered it, not from the time it happened. When we use the imagination to add in the worst case scenario, layers are added. And before you know it, you've got a really serious problem. I once had a client who came to see me for a phobia called gelatophobia. Most of you won't have heard of that. It's fear of laughter. Now, this was really fear-inducing for me because I laugh a lot, and pretty much anything can make me laugh. So the idea of someone in front of me with a fear of laughter petrified me. I'm that person, actually I'm that person that's been laughing backstage all night, but I'm that person that laughs in a quiet room. I laugh in a lift full of strangers. So I had a challenge on my hands here, and it was the first time I'd ever come across this particular phobia. So this is what we did. We used age regression, we used the rewind technique, and we used positive visualization and future pacing. In the state of hypnosis, we started to take the client back to the time the phobia began. 
But this time, this client was going back through the eyes of the adult. They were comforting their inner child, the child that had experienced the reason the phobia began. And in this case, they had been bullied at school. They'd been spat at. They'd been beaten up. They'd been laughed at. So every time they heard someone laugh, they had a panic attack. They had associated laughter with being bullied. You can imagine how life-limiting that can be. They'd become agoraphobic, and by the time they came to see me, they'd lost all hope. So with age regression, we're able to control the way the brain sees the issue. They're comforting their inner child. They're able to see things from the adult's perspective. And it's really helpful for people that are stuck in that frozen memory at nine or 10 years old. But for people that are really sensitive and can't face even the memories, we can do something called the rewind technique, which is where we imagine a room like this, actually, with a cinema and a screen. And what we do is we get the person as the adult to sit in the back row. And they're observing themselves as the younger self who experienced the phobia in the front row. The one in the front row, the inner child or the younger self, is watching the screen. And there's a screenshot of the screen of the memory. The observer adult in the back will press play on a remote control and the memory plays over so they're observing themselves, observing themselves. So we're breaking it down and desensitizing and reprocessing. By doing that, watching the memory from afar, they're able to get used to seeing the phobia again, getting used to seeing the initial fear. Then what we do is rewind it. We take it back to the beginning and we change the format. So we now watch it as an animation, or in black and white, or super duper fast, or removing the sound. We do that a couple of times to desensitize them to the memory. By breaking it down, the brain is getting used to seeing it, and it knows it's in control. This is the most important thing. Like I said, we can use imagination for good, so we know we're in control now, and it changes our perception. Then we do that a few more times and we get the observer self to sit in the front row. We do the same thing again, change the format, rewind, change the format until they feel much more comfortable. Then they enter the screen and they go back into the original memory. At this point, I tell them, you're the director of this film, you can change anything you want. Remember, they're in the deep relaxation state and their brain is able to use that powerful imagination. So now they are seeing themselves in the memory and they can remove things. They can make things smaller. They can change the sound. They can change the colors. They are in control. Their brain is using the imagination for good. And as this is happening, the subconscious mind is responding to it as though it's real. Because the limbic part of the brain, the primitive part of the brain, can't tell the difference between real and imagined. Think of when you've had a nightmare and you've woken up with your heart beating fast and your hands shaking. And for a minute or a second, you think, oh, God, that felt so real. You've had a physical response to something that you've imagined. Well, it's the same with hypnosis. Using the imagination, we can have positive physical responses to the things that we view on the screen or in our memories. Once we've done that a few times, the person is desensitized, they've reprocessed to some degree, and now we can use future pacing and positive visualization. In this case, we get the client to recall a really positive memory, maybe passing driving test, passing an exam, or something where you felt accomplished, excited, and confident. We lock that in, we anchor it in with a word or a phrase. And each time we say that word or phrase, that word or phrase is associated with that feeling. Now, with a phobia, we can use that feeling to change the view of the phobia. So, for example, flight phobias. Someone might get nervous when they think about looking at online brochures for holidays. So we put them into the state of hypnosis. We get them to imagine the online brochure. We bring in that anchored positive feeling. And with repetition, they start to associate looking at online brochures with the positive feeling. And we do that again and again and again. So next would be packing your suitcase, going to the airport, getting on the plane. But each time we make that positive feeling stronger, we're now associating the positive feeling with the original phobia. Now when we do this, the brain has that false memory. Remember, imagination can be used for good. We can literally rewire our brain imagining the good. So by doing this, especially when we repeat it over and over again, 
And for each person, we'd blend in different techniques, add a little bit, take a little bit away. But for that person, repeat, repeat, repeat. Repetition is recognition. The more we repeat something, the more we wire it in. And by doing this, we create an internal sat-nav. And by the end of their therapy, they're going in a completely different direction. That is neuroplasticity. And that is how hypnosis works. So I hope that's been interesting, informative, or helpful. And remember, you can use those techniques not just for phobias, but also for trauma, stress, anxiety, whatever you want. Hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much.